It's well known that there are several types of materials that are different from each other in terms of their mechanical behavior. We have seen how some materials such as metals undergo elastic deformation to a point and loading them further will push them into the regime of plasticity before failing. But not all materials undergo plastic deformation. Also, not all materials undergo elastic deformation that's linear in nature. In fact, there's a whole class of materials that can deform even in the strain ranges of 50% or more with zero to very little plastic deformation before failure. And the stress strain response for such materials is usually highly nonlinear. We see them pretty much every day in both our domestic and engineering lives. These are called as the hyperelastic materials. In very simple terms, hyperelastic materials can be defined as the class of materials that can undergo nonlinear elastic deformation. Typical examples of these materials that showcase such behavior are rubbers, elastomers, soft tissues, foams and many more. Typically, most soft materials behave this way and may be classified as hyperelastic materials. But they still share some similarities with the linear elastic materials regarding the nature of deformation. In both the cases, the work done on them is stored as internal energy and is fully recoverable if the deformation is elastic. Then why do we need a separate class of material models to mimic the behavior of hyperelastic behavior? The key difference between the two is seen in the stress strain response from these materials. In case of hyperelastic materials, this response is usually highly nonlinear to a point where a linear approximation is inaccurate. Take this response for example. Over here, we can see that the response is highly nonlinear with the material having a stiff response to begin with that slowly reduces before stiffening again. So the stiffness is changing throughout the deformation. And if one were to mimic this behavior with a linear elastic material, how would they pick the value of elastic modulus considering that it keeps changing with the strain? Suppose we use the initial stiffness, which is nothing but the slope of the tangent drawn to the initial portion of the curve. In this case, let's compare the stress responses for both the curves at a given strain. We can see that the linear elastic assumption results in very large stress compared to the actual hyperelastic response. This will result in a highly stiff response for the structure and can negatively affect the engineering decisions made based on this result. This is the reason why we need to have a different way of modeling hyperelastic materials so we can capture the full complex response of the soft materials. Now let's look at the key characteristics of hyperelastic materials. The first thing that we notice in this class of materials is that they're generally soft in nature, especially compared to metals. Next, as we have discussed already, their stress strain response is nonlinear, which means that the slope of the curve, which is the instantaneous stiffness of the material, changes with the strain. These materials are known to undergo large deformation with very little to no plastic deformation before they fail. This means that the stiffness or the stress strain curve is monotonically increasing until its failure. Since they mostly undergo elastic deformation, they follow the same path during both loading and unloading. This also means that the energy is conserved, meaning the work done in deforming it is all stored as internal energy and is fully recoverable upon unloading. 
Most of the hyperelastic materials, such as rubbers and soft tissues, are nearly or fully incompressible. But other set of materials, such as foams and sponges, which are known to be compressible, can also be modeled as hyperelastic materials using special class of hyperelastic models. In this section, we will learn what are the different ways of modeling the hyperelastic materials and see what kinds of experiments are to be conducted to calibrate them. We'll also discuss a few applications and see how the hyperelastic materials are used in engineering analysis. In this course, we will limit our discussion to nearly or fully incompressible hyperelastic materials as these are the most commonly seen in engineering applications.